it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, today, and I, I would encourage those who sit on this side to maybe move over. Um, I would talk to you about a new type of movie which we are just starting to make, and it's unlike anything you have ever seen before. The actors of the movies are molecules and atoms. The directors and producers are scientists from all over the world. As much as they would love to get a award from a big uh, festival, they really would like to get a Nobel Prize. And um, we are using a very different type of light, a very different type of lighting. Um, the lighting we are using is x-rays. Now, some of you, or a lot of you, are familiar with x-rays. Here you can see um, when you check in your bag at the airport or a dental x-ray or actually uh, the x-ray of a pregnant woman. Um, but x-rays have, in addition to revealing uh, piercing through material, it, they have another property. They can make visible extremely small things such as molecules in a more subtle way. This uh, photo 51 was taken in 1952 and it turned out to be the source of one of the most dis important discoveries of the last century, namely the discovery of the DNA, uh, the double helix. Uh, Watson and Crick, based on this X-ray photo taken, were able to reconstruct and, and find how the double helix molecule looks like. Now, X-rays have since been extremely successfully used to make still images of those molecules and many other molecules uh, which are um, important in biology but also in, in other sciences. We are now at the brink here at SLAC to turn these still images into movies. In order to do that, we will need a camera, a shutter speed, faster than anything which has ever been produced with x-rays. So let me start in the spirit of, of uh, Muybridge. This is, uh, was taken in uh, 1878, and this was taken with uh, about one thousandth of a second shutter speed. Already quite remarkable, and it resolved the bet between Senator Stanford whether at any time all four hoofs are off the ground when a horse is galloping. Um, now, if you want to take a, a very good image of a hummingbird, you probably need about 10 times faster shutter speed because the wings are really moving incredibly fast, uh, even less visible to the eye than the hoofs of a horse. Now, if you want to make a movie of, an, for example, a bullet going through an apple, you need a shutter speed about a thousand times faster than my bridge. We are talking one millionth of a second shutter speed for these kinds of movies. If, on the other hand, you want to take a movie of a molecule, and what, I've sh what I show you here is the famous water molecule with the oxygen and the two hydrogens, and in reality, these water molecules actually look something like this because they're constantly vibrating and moving. If you wanted to capture that, you would need a shutter speed 10 million times faster than the shutter speed of a bullet going through an apple. This is the shutter speed, and that's the kind of X-ray shutter speed we are uh, just started to have up at Slack with our new facility. Now, what we really want to do is we don't really we want to, don't want just to study how water molecules vibrate, but we want to study how chemical reactions take place. And here you have a, a very important chemical reaction, namely the splitting of water by photosynthesis is one of the big unsolved problems in science and there are many, many others and what we really would like to do is make movies of these chemical reactions in real time and with the resolution of the molecules and there is no other place on earth where you have even the potential to, to do such things uh, than our new X-ray laser at SLAC. Now here we are um, just above the hill uh, this is Sand Hill. This, this is actually two, hi, Highway 280, um, our film studio. Basically, we have we are based on a three-kilometer-long accelerator, and the um, where the action is with all the, um, the with all the movies going on is in this area, in the direct uh, elongation of this accelerator. 
Now, um, when you look from Palo Alto, it, uh, you basically here you have Stanford, Stanford campus, the Hoover Tower, and, and we are right now here, so we are just up the hill. Uh, it's an impressive building. Uh, so now, b before I show you our very first results, I would like you to fasten your seat belts because I'm going to give you the tour, now a quick tour, two minutes of our film studio. Um, so this is the last kilometer of our uh, accelerator and we are, the building is above ground but the, really the, the action takes on underground about 20 feet. We are shooting with an, with an optical laser um, onto a copper target and on the copper target we, we release electrons which are accelerated up on the side and then into our main linear accelerator where they gain energy and speed uh, they are also compressed to be very short. Now they are traveling along with basically the speed of light uh, in these extremely short bursts of about 5 billion electrons at a time. Um, they are going through a transport hall uh, underground and then come into the heart of our X-ray laser. Um, in this place, uh, which is a, at a very stable temperature, the electrons are starting a slalom track. They are forced into a sideways move, movement. When they do that, they start to emit X-rays, and these X-rays are traveled together with the electrons. They become so intense that they start to affect the electrons and then amplify themselves uh, by a million times brighter. Now the X-rays travel together with the electrons. We don't need the electrons because we want to make X-ray movies, so we bend the electron electrons down into the ground, and the X-rays continue into our real film studios, and those are currently six instruments, um, and each of those instruments uh, carries out a different type of experiments. Here you can see them, the, we call that the near hall, and then three in the far hall. And these instruments, although they look very complicated, they do nothing else than bringing the X-rays together with the object which we want to study, namely the movies. Now, when you have a burst of X-rays of that intensity, everything flies apart and is destroyed very fast. What we need to do is we need to be faster than the destruction. So we call this image or make the movie before you destroy, and so we replenish, we shoot in our molecules, we destroy them, but we can capture the picture of the molecules before they are destroyed. And this is how these experiments look like in principle. You have the X-ray pulses coming and the molecules are flying in, and although they fly apart, you get a, what we call a diffraction image on the screen, and you can then use that image uh, just like uh, Watson and Crick did in 1952, and you can then, by combining these images in three dimensions, you can then reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of these molecules. But now, being able to do that uh, on, a, on such a short time scale, we will then be able, if we bring these molecules into the different forms, we will be able to do actually stroboscopic movies with that. And so let, let me just show you some of the very first results which we got at LCLS. Uh, this is our X-ray laser. Um, before I do that, I'll show you just a couple of shots how it looks in reality. This is our uh, underlater hole. That's where the X-rays are made. Uh, here's the control room. Uh, it looks, we have six of those control rooms. They're, they're quite impressive. Um, here's a scientist just getting ready for one of the experiments. Uh, another scientist on our, on our biological imaging uh, instrument. And now this is a... Uh, a diffraction of a, a photosynthetic protein uh, in a 3D reconstruction made at SLAC uh, with, the, with these ultra short movies. This was. Let me just start it. This was produced by a very large collaboration from, uh, from Europe uh, and also Arizona State University, and they were able to use these short flashes to reconstruct. Uh, by using the, to creating these images to reconstruct uh, this, it's called photosystem one. It's a, it's, it's a part of protein which is part of the photosynthetic process. Uh, in a second experiment, this was published in Nature this, earlier this year. A second experiment um, was 
the single shot diffraction of a live virus. Uh, this is a very large virus and you can, uh, by reconstructing these single shots, you can then make um, uh, look actually how the, the inside of the virus looks like. Right now there is no other method to, go, to look in the inside of a live virus. No, no other technique is able to do that. And this is a very particular virus which might actually have movements in it. And so the, the hope from the scientists is that in the future they will uh, possibly be able to resolve uh, the movements, the, the moving parts in this virus. And here's some results which is not even published yet. This is going to come out very, th very soon. This is the first three-dimensional reconstruction of the inside of this called MIMI virus. So you, you can see, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into detail to describe what the different parts are, but basically the scientists are now able to think about where, where is the where is the DNA, where are the different parts, where are the cells located. And this is not cryogenically prepared, this is a live virus basically. And so this is kind of really the goal uh, in the future. So in the spirit of Palo Alto, in the spirit of this film festival, in the spirit of Edward Muybridge, we are now starting to make molecular movies and you can imagine that we are very excited about it. And I hope, uh, by thanking you, I hope that over the coming years we will be able to show you many more of real molecular movies. Thank you very much. Yeah, Alf said I can take some questions. Please go ahead. Yes, exactly. So, they, so the, the, this is really electron density uh, c converted into colors, correct. And so the idea is there's not, there's hardly anything known about this virus. The idea is uh, the scientists now think they might have actually found uh, uh, already with these first images and the resolution will be much more improved in the future. Um, they think they already found uh, a location maybe where, where the DNA is located. And so far, no, the, all of what is known about it was just based on speculations. Okay, wonderful work you're doing, just fantastic. So, um, you showed us the accelerator. How long is it, approximately? Well, thanks for this question. Um, our, the LINAC, which was originally built 50 years ago, is when you go to Wikipedia, it's listed as the second longest building in the world be behind the Chinese wall, um, even though the, it's an unfair comparison because the Chinese wall is not straight. Uh, it is three kilometers long. And for our X-ray laser right now, we are only using the last kilometer, but we are already in, in the works of building a second laser where we use the middle kilometer, and we hope that in about 10 years we are going to build a third laser where we use the first kilometer. So we are going to eventually go back to using all the three kilometer uh, straight section of that tunnel. And if you ever uh, feel that you would like to see it, it's a, it's a a very amazing place. Uh, please just contact us and you can come and I'll give you a tour. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, one more uh, thing. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you are actually destroying what uh, you are imaging, that you are uh, capturing before this, uh, whether it's a virus or a molecule gets destroyed. So can you say more about uh, actual applications? You know, are you intending to use this for medical or things that don't get destroyed? Or wh what is the, wh where are you going? Well, well that, it's a, actually a very good question. The, um, a lot of the work on the proteins, uh, we think we will find, um, we, it is not a problem that the samples are destroyed because as I said, we will get, we will get the image before the destruction takes place. and. Um, and the way how it is done also when you make the movie, it's kind of done in a stroboscopic way. So, so you start, you, let's say you start a chemical reaction with a, with a laser or with some other short flash, and then you probe it, and then you continue that, and so you build up in a stroboscopic way, you build up your, um, your image. So we, we think that one of the applications um, where we hope to have a big impact is 
um, on biological systems which are hard to crystallize well. Because if you can crystallize it well, you can do it with a more conventional technique. But if you only get tiny crystals or no crystals at all, we, our place is kind of the unique place. And unfortunately, or fortunately for us, there are more than 60% of all the proteins you cannot really crystallize. Another application are really viruses and kind of large biological objects. But then we are also thinking uh, a lot about nanotechnology. So we have a lot of applications by looking at um, how nanomaterials and actually also how catalysts like uh, chemical reactions on the surface or in a, in a, in a small environment, how does, how does a chemical reaction work? We really don't hardly know anything about it. What we know is before and after. We have never watched it. We have never been able to watch a fast chemical reaction in real time with the resolution of a, of a molecule or of an atom. And so those are the applications where we really would like to have an impact. Maybe you explained it and I missed it, but how do you achieve this fast stroboscopic switching to catch the image? Yeah, so the, basically the, the, the rate at which our X-ray pulses come uh, is 120 times per second. So it's not, it's not incredibly fast. What is the, the, what is the phenomenal achievement of the X-ray laser is that the pulses are incredibly short. So they, they, they are only uh, a millionth of a billionth uh, of a second short, or may, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, and, and it is that time, it's the length of the pulse, which actually eventually determines the, uh, the resolution, the, the shutter speed which you can achieve. And so the, w the way we, we accomplish that is we start with a very short pulse laser to kick out uh, electrons, actually normal electrons from a copper, from a piece of metal, and, and then we just keep them. And so that laser pulse, that's a normal laser pulse, it's a very short pulse, and so the, the burst of electrons stays very short, and then we do a trick. In the accelerator, we actually uh, send them through a chicane which even shortens shortens them, bunches them even closer together. So that's really the trick. The trick is to get many, many electrons, 10, 10 billion electrons, to get them very, very close together. And they travel with the speed of light. And that, the wonderful thing is with the, when they, because they travel so fast, even though they are, they are not very t tiny, small, but in our frame, from, in the observer's frame, they're all bunched together into, into something which is in, of incredible short. Okay, one last one. Um, do you see any possibility of scaling this down uh, to do things like uh, fast uh, genome sequencing? Well, it, um, I think it's a, it's a good question, and I don't think I, have, I, I know the answer to this at, at this point. Uh, because um, th there, are, you know, there are a whole variety of different methods now to do, I mean, to do genome sequencing. I, I'm not sure whether our, you know, our instrument will be helpful for that. Um, I, we, we, fe we feel that in particular, I mean, in particular uh, things which take, which are very fast and things which cannot be, um, cannot be actually grown and reproduced in, an, in a way that, that any of the other more traditional techniques like an electron microscope or, or a, a regular x-ray, uh, a, a more regular x-ray source can do. This is kind of the niche where we go in and, and it, it needs to be seen whether, whether genome sequencing uh, uh, will be part of that. <laughs>